Polgreen, Editor-in-Chief of HuffPost. I'm thrilled to chat with Hannah Gadsby today at Build. Nanette, Hannah's masterpiece, saw the adored comedian complete an unheard of comedy trifecta, taking home Australia's most prestigious comedy award, The Barry, for best show at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, followed by the Helpman Award for best comedy performer, and finally, the world's biggest prize for live comedy, the best comedy show award at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. The New York Times says the laughs of her show are means to an end, which, it, which is, at its core, a ferocious attack on comedy itself. Let's take a look at her special and bring Hannah to the stage. <laughs> Don't be so sensitive. Oh, that is the most common nugget of advice I get. Because I'm, I'm a very sensitive person. But I get told to stop being so sensitive an awful lot. And it is always yelled. <laughs> which I find very insensitive. I don't get it. Stop that, it's so sensitive. I don't understand. Why is insensitivity something to strive for? I happen to know that my sensitivity is my strength. I know that. I know that it's my sensitivity that's helped me navigate a very difficult path in life. So when somebody tells me to stop being so sensitive, you know what? I feel a little bit like a nose being lectured by a fart. Not the problem. <laughs> Hannah Gatsby, thank you for being with us here at Built. Thank you. So uh, you, you've done something pretty extraordinary. Uh, you've uh, created an, a, a uh, comedy show that is an assault on comedy and then given up comedy just at the moment at the height of your comedic fame. Um, why would you want to do that? Yeah, it might have been an error. Um, <laughs> I wasn't at my height when I wrote the show and then it, it just keeps happening. Um, so it's a, I'm in a rethink <laughs> at the moment. But uh, I think generally whatever I'll do, I won't be uh, participating in comedy uh, as I was taught comedy was, which is, you know, your job is to make people laugh then get off. I'll still get off. Yeah, I would recommend it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so let's back up. What's the story behind Nanette? I mean, your comedy has always mined your personal life, um, but you've taken it in a radically different direction. Where did, where did this, this idea come from? There was a lot of different things coming together at once. Um, frustration. I felt like my career had plateaued, and I felt I was getting a little bitter, and I was never a bitter person. And so I started to think about that, and then sort of I thought, well, do I, do I want to be a comedian, honestly? And the lifestyle didn't suit me. And I thought, maybe I'll just get off, get off, pop off the hamster wheel. Because um, uh, in Australia, we do it a little differently here. We do festival, I, well, I'm a festival comic, so I do, I write a new hour every year and tour it around festivals. Um, and usually in the UK, I've never performed here uh, before this show. Um, so that, I think that's a different kind of comedy to what, uh, it is here where it's pretty much a brick wall on a stool, I believe, and a lot of shouty, shout, shout, yuck, That's, yuck. The, that's yeah. the aesthetic. But the, the basics are the same. Uh, it's jokes. Yep. yep. Yeah, it's still there, but it's a, a, writing a new hour every year means that you... Meant, well, I personally did a lot more in the way of stories, I suppose. Those jokes always formed part of the stories, and I always sort of prioritised, you know, storytelling. And I, th I think I felt a frustration that I thought, I think I'm really good at this. Why aren't I getting a little bit more of a nudge? Mm. Uh, and I realised it wasn't because I wasn't good at my job, it was because my story wasn't important. So this show is a, like, let me tell you, I know that you think that my story isn't important. Um, and it's an attempt to go, you know, try and rewrite that and say, listen. So in co comics often mine their own life stories, um, but they mine them in a particular way. And I think female comics in particular mine them in a particular way. Um, you know, Louis C.K. can talk about his humiliation. Um, he can talk about his embarrassment. This to a point. This does. Well, to a point. Um, you know, his masturbation jokes somehow seem less funny now. Um, so how had you sort of framed your story prior to Nanette? And, and what's different about it? I used to be very apologetic and self-deprecating. Uh, and that works for me. That's how I am. You know, I'm not... not a, you know, I don't have a lot of swagger in the world. So it, it seemed natural for me to be a little bit low-key on stage. But uh, after doing it for about 10 years, I began to see that it was eroding 
my sense of self. To, you know, uh, there was a real discrepancy between how I could be on stage and, you know, I wanted to get better at life. But comedy sort of suspends you in a perpetual state of adolescence in that you have to be a bit of a loser. And the difference between Louis C.K. and I is we can both say we're losers. And when I say it, the world goes, yeah, you are a bit. And when Louis does it, they go, you're a genius. And that is what pissed me off. I, I think that's a, that pissed a lot of people off. Um, so there's a line in the show that really struck me uh, where you say that um, um, it isn't humility, it's humiliation when you make fun of yourself if you're a person who doesn't represent power. Um, I don't even know what to ask you about that, but it really resonated with me. Where, where, where did that come from? I, I think I was really, you know, it's the point I got to after thinking a lot about um, the way I told my story, which at once was empowering for a while and then became destructive. Mm. And, you know, looking back at the way I told my story, and it really, really hit home during the gay marriage debate in Australia, which... Uh, went on for quite a long time and I began to feel... I was surprised at how much it impacted me, that, because, you know, I'm old, dead inside, all the rest. Um, so I thought, you know, at first I was like, this is bad for young queer people. This is really bad. I felt really concerned about people, particularly in regional places, which is where I grew up, and I felt that isolation. And that's what upset me about the gay marriage debate in Australia. But as it kicked on and kept going... I, I crumbled, like, cause, uh, in, and I had to take stock of my participation in that, in that I told my story wrong. So people would go, oh, pride, they're so happy. And I, I'm like, no, I think there's a dark, dark streak of internalised homophobia running through, particularly, you know, the older generation, mm. where, uh, you know, gay culture is like, we're pithy, we're funny. Well, mm. it, lesbians are just angry, but no one really worries about yeah, it. Yeah, we don't usually get funny. That's not our brand. <laughs> no, and I'm really trying to pull back from that. I stumbled into funny. I'm like, it's not me. Oh, mm. no, no. <laughs> Terrible mistake. Mm. Um, well, and I think that that's... Um, I think that that's, that's really gets back to your life story, right? I mean, you grew up um, not just in Australia, which is, let's be honest, a really far away place, but in kind of, if I can say it, the ass end of Australia. You grew up in Tasmania. Um, deeply conservative. Um, what, what was it like? And, and how did that form you? Well, it was my reality. So it's hard to know, like, what it was like as a kid because it was all I knew. Um, and it's a, it's a really quiet place, very small island, but everyone knows each other. Everyone knew my, my history before I was even born. Mm. You know, that kind of, there's intergenerational rumour mill. So it's a bad place to make a mistake and it's an even worse place to be a mistake. Mm. Uh, so I, I got out of there as, as soon as uh, it was humanly possible for me to do that. Um, it's since become, you know, quite a lot freer. Uh, Tasmania has the best human rights protection laws in Australia now. So kind of like it, I think it's worth mentioning that we learned our lesson through the... Uh, but, I mean, homosexuality was criminalised until 1997. 1997, yeah. So that's where I was 19 when that uh, happened. So in my show I sort of hint that it's like it's a bit late for me. Like the damage was done. I'd, you know, already been soaked in significant shame. Um, as I grappled with my identity. Um, so uh, it, it, it's, it wasn't a great place, but I've only just started to realise and understand mm. that that was not necessary, that that is not OK. You know, you just get on with it. You just go, well, I'm worthless. And, you know, you get through that a bit, but you're still self-deprecating then and you're just like, I'm still feeding that narrative of, like, basically I'm a piece of shit. Um, and I may still will be, but everyone may as well be. Yeah, yeah. seems sounds like the human yeah. condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Um, your, your show really takes as its subject comedy itself. It's quite meta, actually. Yeah, which is really surprising because I used to always hate comedians who deconstruct comedy on stage. I'm like, tell a joke, go away. You know, comedy is quite boring to me. But it got to the point where I'm like, I, I became a comedy nerd, and I applied the same brain. I studied art history. Mm. And I saw a lot of the similar, we'll call it dick swinging, mm. uh, that, that I'd noticed in early modern art when people, you know, artists were destroying what went before so they could become the artist of the moment. Mm -hmm. 
and and that sort of you know one movement led to another and destroyed another. This is art. This is art. And in comedy, it sort of felt like, you know, to be uh, to use you know, to deliberately trigger trauma, you know, we'll use those turn, turns of phrase, you know, to use these controversial topics and use rape as a punchline, just always seemed, it was like, oh, you're not actually saying anything. It's, the, it's different language, but it's the same story. And that, same, that story is that women and children don't matter. Mm. And that's what I felt when I studied art history. It's like, modern art changed everything. It changed everything from the language of art uh, the, the, what, what, why people, how people were artists, all this. Modern art changed absolutely everything, destroyed the academy, except for one thing, the subject matter of female nude. Women were still being painted asleep and in the bath. And it's like, it's a different language, but it's the same story. Mm. And so, I, I mean, I'm just furious, really. Slow motion. I mean, I still haven't, I still talk slow, so it's hard for people. I creep up, my fury creeps up on mm. people. Um, but yeah. Well, I mean, having seen your show at the Soho Playhouse and then watching the special, um, it, it creeps up on the audience. Um, you come in expecting laughs, and the effect is I mean, there are a lot of laughs, it's very funny, uh, but the effect is something quite different. Um, in the room, what does that feel like in the room? And, and it, 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 it seems to me that you actually have this like very deep control over the audience. Yeah, yeah. It's an, when I first began I, this show, the first uh, versions of it, I didn't. It was very mm. frightening. I thought it was very, very vulnerable on stage and it was a very dangerous place for me to be and it was taking quite a toll and so I wrote in a lot more jokes and made it more bulletproof, so to speak. And that once that started to evolve, I felt a certain power and that made me feel quite frightened in and of itself because I felt like I was breaking some sort of moral code, letting people come in, they're like, really? And when people go, we're going to laugh, they relax, they open up. And then I'm throwing trauma mm. right into this open. And so then I, in the room, I'm very aware that I'm upsetting people and myself. And it's this, it's, it's very, it's traumatic. I, I think that's a fair assessment, yeah. um, having, having seen it both live and on television. Um, you have this line in the show that you call a joke, um, um, a question artificially inseminated with tension. What does that mean? Well, because the question, uh, joke is a, I, I compare it to a question and answer. You know, a question holds tension, people are waiting for an answer. A joke is different because you're not expecting the answer. So you're like, oh, wow. Um, and that, that works. You works without, you know, the clinical setup punchline. It's just in conversation. You can just say something that's left a field and that's a joke. But in, in a comedy show, it's a construct. And I just really want to make people aware that stand up comedy isn't a natural communication you know people think it's different to theater because theater's got the fourth wall and la da let's not go off script but but i just really wanted to show people just how you know constructed comedy is mm. and by saying that's artificially inseminated by tension it is you know i'm i'm doing that to people like i'll tell you a joke i'm putting tension in the room so i can make you laugh and in reality that is why a lot of comics use sexual assault as a subject matter in comedy uh, not because they want to do anything about it or be constructive or have a constructive cons conversation. Just simply if you say to a room full of people the word rape, it creates tension. And that makes the comedian's job easier. And I don't think, I don't think it's that great. Yeah, I mean, I think we talk about comedy like that as being brave somehow, smashing through taboos, um, you know, taking on things that people aren't comfortable taking on. And you're saying that that's kind of a fraud. Yeah, like I, I have no problem with taking on any, any I, don't, I don't believe in censorship. I believe in freedom of speech, but I believe in a responsibility when it comes to that. Like, if you're going to talk about these things, say something useful, try and be constructive. Um, and particularly men who have not, you know, been victims of sexual assault or hopefully not even participated in sexual assault, shut Sorry. up. It's not your story. Just shut up about it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That seems fair enough. Yeah. 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 Um, so you are, um, in this story, you're talking about really horrible things that happen to you, and yet there are moments of, like, real humour. Um, how do you sort of balance that in, in your storytelling? Because I was struck by something you say at the end of the story, which is, uh, at the end of the, the performance, which is that um, laughter is not the best medicine stories are. So what is the role of laughter in 
in stories? Because I think there is one, right? I mean, there's a very important role. Well, it's that thing I said before, when people laugh, they open up. Mm. And that's, you know, where you can, the story has a ch- more of a chance to sort of appeal to a humanity. Uh, I think when you're just t- talking at people and you're laying out a story without any sort of, emo- you know, with less humour, people, it's much easier for people to be defensive. Mm. Um, and, and shut down and not hear. You know, when you make someone laugh, you're, you're not only releasing connection, but you're creating a connection. Mm. And so it's an incredibly important tool, but I don't believe it's the reason to speak on its own. If your only reason you're opening your mouth is to make someone laugh, good on you. So if you're not going to do comedy anymore, what's next? Look, I don't know. Mm. Um, never been a great planner. <laughs> um, uh, I've got, I'm writing a book that's edging, edging to completion. Um, uh, and look, I need a break. This show has been it's full on, uh, as we say back home, full on. Mm. And I need to rest and see what it's done to me. I don't know what I've done to myself. I've opened up personal trauma night after night after night for 18 months. And I need to take care. Well, I was going to ask, because, you know, um, I after the show um, at the Soho Playhouse, I thought, oh, I should try and get backstage and say how much I loved it. And I thought, oh, that's probably the last thing that she wants, yeah, um, yeah. is to be confronted by um, uh, uh, feed- feedback, as you uh, put it, um, either positive or negative. But I, I, su- I suspect you've gotten a lot of feedback about this show. Uh, I, I kept a very low profile, particularly post-show, but even online on this. I haven't responded to any of the, the feedback. I haven't, I could have been able to. I, I've given everything I have on stage. Yeah. Um, but I am aware that I... Gen- like, I've never... S- not just the volume of response that I've got with this show, but the ratio of positive to negative has meant that I can't see the... You know, I can, you know I'm trained to always see the negative in a pattern. Like, if I'm doing a comedy show and one person's... If everyone's having a great time, one person's not laughing, I'm like, this is shit. Mm. This is a bad show just because one person's got a face like a slapped ass. Mm. And that's that's how I work, you know. That's I think most comedians work like that. But with this show, the the response has been so overwhelmingly positive, and uh, that I'm just I don't know quite know how to how to deal with it. <laughs> well, sometimes good things can be as tough as bad things. Um, uh, you started writing this show uh, before the Me Too moment really kicked off, I would think. Oh, this um, is yeah. I started writing it late, you know, end of 2016. So it's nearly coming up two years, really. So uh, obviously you were well aware of the issues um, under undergirding uh, being a human and particularly a human female. One cannot be unaware. Um, how is that? Um, how has that shaped the perception of the show and the way that you um, that you perform it? What surprised me is how I didn't have to rewrite at all. That was all just sitting there. I'd obviously tapped into the same zeitgeist that gave the Me Too movement the wave mm-hmm. that it needed. Um, so victims began to be heard. I think that's the, the different, different thing that I noticed over the course of doing the show. Uh, I think that defensiveness has opened up to a like, oh, let's listen. Uh, and it's a subtle change, but um, yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I answered that, to be honest. I, I think you did. Um, oh, good on me. But, it, but it's, yeah, well done. Um, but I think it's also kind of opened up a space for, um, for, I shouldn't say it's opened up in a passive way. I mean, I think uh, it has, uh, people have created a space for stories like yours. I think you're seeing a different kind of story being told um, and being received in a fundamentally different way now. Well, I think it's worth noting that a lot of this change happened during... Well, in Australia, it was the Royal Commission into the Abuse of Children. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, listening to victims, was there was a really powerful change during that, uh, you know... Um, what did I call it? Uh, what, what, I mean, what, I, words are my 
freaking job. <laughs> um, the Inquirer. Mine too, have yeah, the same. The Inquirer. No, I should quit, yeah. Um, the, the Inquirer. I think you already have, by yeah, the way. Sorry, yeah. I'll keep laboring that point. Um, yeah, so the Inquirer there, you know, you saw a huge, massive cultural shift from people looking at victims of sexual assault and worrying more about the reputation of priests or uh, institutions uh, that, that let this happen. And almost, you know, overnight, it shifted to going, we need to listen to these people. And I was really profoundly affected by that. And that was in the years before Me Too. And I think Me Too is part of that, where victims are given a voice. And I think that's a remarkable moment. Well, and, and they're believed, right? I mean, um, if all else fails, I think you have a real future in uh, feminist uh, T-shirt sloganeering. Uh, there was a great line um, in your show. I think it was... Um, there's nothing stronger than a broken woman who has rebuilt herself. I think you could you could do a pretty brisk business in bumper stickers yeah. and T-shirts. Do you know, look, I fantasised about selling merchandise, but not after that show. Imagine <laughs> signing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, 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 let's capitalise on this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a it's 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 hard to know where where the line go is between capitalizing and just telling your story, right? Yeah. We're all capitalizing on our stories. Yeah, shifting some units. Yes, exactly. Um, let's open it up to the audience for some questions. Hi. Oh, can I? Uh, this is going to be a, an online question. All right. Um, Jesse would like to know: uh, Do you feel that it's important for comedians to be vulnerable in order to be funny? No, no, I think it's important for me to be vulnerable. I think that, I mean, I just don't, I'm not a trained performer, so I don't know how not to be. Um, I think it's important for the audience not to smell bullshit. And I think vulnerability is part of that. So I think if you're not being true to whoever you are in the world, if you're somebody completely different, the audience knows that, the audience can smell that, and that is where you're not funny. People are just like, mm. So it, I, I think the vulnerability comes with being close to your natural voice. Thanks, internet. <laughs> internet <laughs> has the good. best question. I didn't yeah. know it looked like that. Okay, we got one more. Hello. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, uh, especially in your early days when you started doing comedy, what did you do when you told people you were doing uh, comedy and people responded immediately by saying, oh, cool, tell me a joke? Because that just seems like something that like happens. I tell them a joke. Uh. <laughs> wow, well, we aim to please. Yeah, yeah. 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 Usually well, a really offensive one, and yeah. hopefully their children are present. Well, go on then. <laughs> hmm? Go on then. Oh, you. My favorite one is the. <laughs> can I tell? You what's the worst thing to hear when giving Willie Nelson a blowjob? Oh no. <laughs> please. I'm not Willie Nelson. <laughs> It's not my joke, but, you know, then they stop asking the, that question. Okay. Yeah. All right, we have time for one more question. Yeah. Hi, fellow Australian here. G'day, mate. Hello, g'day. Um, Dressed up. Good on you. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, like, um, what do you think actually of Australian uh, comedy now? Like, and how do you think people from overseas perceive Australian comedy? Um, that question is very Australian. What do you think everyone thinks of us? Um, we're very needy. Tall we're very puppies. needy. Tall puppies. Yeah. Oh, you know, we're just we're just very earnest. But um, I think this, the state of Australian comedy is incredible at the moment. We've, uh, the best performers, I believe, um, are, are women at the moment. And like the Helpman Award this year, I think uh, there's eight nominees and six of them are women, and they're incredible. And that is part of the culture that the Melbourne International Comedy Festival fostered, um, which is uh, it takes people out of the bars and the clubs and being competitive for punchlines and into crafting hour-long, you know, you know, not all of them storytellers, all across all genres, but I think that's part of creating, you know, busting that open. And that's that's I think Australian comedy has got some really amazing natural you know, voices coming out of there, and I think it's an exciting uh, landscape. And I think this, the streaming revolution has really exposed a lot more people to um, to Australian comedy. I mean, uh, I first heard of you because my wife was a huge fan of Please Like Me. Um, yeah. And so, you know, now you're on Netflix, and, um, you know, lots more people can watch Please Like Me, which they should, because it's yeah. a wonderful show. it is a really great show. Um, <laughs> so, um, Hannah, thank you so much for cool. being with us here at thank Build. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>